All right. See, am I on or is just the other mic? What about now? Am I on? Okay, get right ahead. I'm on now? All right. Go ahead, Mr. Ed. You need me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm only about three weeks late with this, um, and I apologize. Um, I'm so glad that the Lord knows when he formed us in the womb who we were going to be and what we were going to be. And I'm so glad that he prepared Jay yes. for such a time as this. Um, I know I've joined all the Sunday school class thanking God that we have the Sunday school teachers that we're doing. Not, Amen. Not putting anybody else down, but I've known Jay for a long, long time, and he's never wavered. He's never Amen. changed. And um, I appreciate you, Jay. And all the Sunday school class, I know, appreciate you as well. So happy, very belated birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really, I really do. I appreciate that. Y'all mean a lot to me, more than, more than you realize. Sometimes some of you tell me things. You don't really need to know how much I need to hear sometimes what some of you say, whether you know that or not. Uh, but I do appreciate it. I'm not going to have anything new for you today, but go back to Matthew 25. It's kind of going to pick up where we left off last week with the same thought. You know, we've been talking for some time. And we started Matthew 24. I forget how many weeks ago now. Um... And I know we're in 25, but still it's carrying on the same, same topic about being ready for the Lord Jesus Christ. If he was to come today, be, being ready, that's, that's everything we've talked about. Um, last week, we talked about the day, time was going to come when we would stand before God and with our, with our talents, with, with, with what we had, what we hadn't done uh, for God. And I told you last week that all of us have a talent, and I'm going to carry that thought over this week. We all have a talent. In, in, the, in the form of helping somebody. Um, that, that, that's, you, know, you don't work to be saved, to understand completely. But because that you are saved, you should want to help those that, that you see where, when you see needs in their life, especially when, when you have the opportunity and you have the means yeah. to help somebody. Now, I realize that, you, you know, that sometimes there's some things you can't do. I, I understand that. But when you have the means and opportunity and God lets you know it, know it and you don't help somebody, I already believe you're wrong. Uh, I believe that's why God, and this year I'm going to prove that from God's word this morning. Uh, and, and, and we'll just take him there. There, that's all I got to go on is the Bible. I mean, that, that's all I got. And uh, but, but we're going to learn that this morning. There, there will come a day when, he, when he'll divide the sheep from the goats, which is where we're at today, Matthew 25, verse 31. Now I'm going to use, I'm going to finish up Matthew 25 and the rest of this chapter and I'm going to probably use a little bit in 1 John and I'm probably going to use a little bit in another familiar story in Luke chapter 10, um, probably. But just, that's right. sometimes we just need reminding. I won't tell you one thing you don't know. Sometimes we just need reminding what God's put us here for. I mean, you know, we, we, me especially, I'm, I, I, get, I, I know I've got my day halfway planned for tomorrow and that's it plan changes for me, but uh, a lot of times we'll plan what we're going to do, whether it be work or, or vacations, but we don't plan on helping people. We don't plan on serving God like we ought to. We might say, well, I'll be here to church next Sunday, and that's the plan. But what about tomorrow? What are you going to do for him tomorrow? What, what are you going to do for him Tuesday or Wednesday? You see what I mean? And God places people in our path sometimes. I, I really believe that to see what, what we're going to do, see if, if we'll um, help somebody as often as, as he puts somebody in our, in our place. But anyway, in Matthew 25, 34, 31 says when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory verse 32 and before him shall be gathered all nations everybody now that this won't be uh, this race or that race or, or, or this country versus that country all nations will be gathered at the same place and he shall separate them the one from the other as the sheep divided as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. In other words, they'll be all in one together, is what he's saying at the end, in the end. And it'd be no different than him, him looking on and saying, the sheep, sheep go to my right and the goats to my left. That, that's as simple as it'll be. But that, that'll be with salvation with, with us, uh, whether we've been born again, whether we've been washed in his blood, whether we know him as Lord and Savior for our life. He, he will divide us, verse 33. That's all this is saying. And he, shall, uh, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. 34. Then shall the king say unto him, uh, them on the right hand, 
Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen, he's been preparing. I mean, I, you know, a kingdom since the foundation of the world, that's hard for us to even imagine. But he's been preparing a place for us that, uh, that long, for those that know him, those that have been saved, those that will be on his right. But trust me, there will be a lot of people that go to his left side. There will be people that may have tried in this earth, Lord, Lord, but they'll go to that left side. You've got to have a born-again experience. You've got to know him as Lord and Savior. Like, and you can know that you're saved. I know I say that often, but you, are, you don't realize there's a lot of people. Um, I really believe they just think they're saved. And I'm not their judge. I, I, I don't do that. Um, but I'm just that, that, that there is a way to come to Christ, and then there's a way you don't come to Christ. And, and there's got to be a time in your life that you, there's got to be a time you can look back in your life that, that God come into your heart and he come into your life and he changed you and he made you a new creature. If you can't remember a time like that in your life, you, you don't have it. I told you I attended a, a baby baptism. I, I don't know now. They've grown now. It's been 18, 17, 18 years ago. And the preacher that preached the baptism service gave his testimony how, how, how he was baptized and saved because his mama did it when he was, when he was uh, uh, christened way back. And he was an older guy back then. He was probably my age back then. But he, and, and he don't remember nothing. But he says he got good feelings when he goes back to the place where his mama said it happened. I mean, I, I, I feel sorry for people like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not nobody's judge. I'm not, but then if he can't remember a place like that, I mean, he's lost. You, you've got to know it. I mean, but he went on and on and on, made a big, big, big thing out of it because, you know, because the denomination they were in, if you ever, you, your parents do it, if you ever give it again, they believe you're desecrating the holy sacraments and stuff like that, so you would never do it again, supposedly. But they, there's a real group of people that's really not being changed. They don't, they, they can't remember a time in their life that, something, that they were truly changed. They're going on, on what somebody's told them what, or, 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 or somebody's led them astray, but it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong, and I hate that for people. I, I do. I mean, that's right. I told you, there's a lot of things that I, I guess I'm without today in a lot of ways. We're lacking in a lot of areas. But I'm telling you, I'm glad I know the truth. Amen. I would take the truth over every, all the riches of the world because they will pass away. And that's what's going to happen. I mean, there'll be people that will stand before him that day and he'll say, depart from me. I don't know you. I never knew you. There'll be church members. Trust me when I tell you, there'll be church members that will stand in that group they'll say, depart from me. There'll be preachers. There'll be teachers. There'll be deacons. Yep. I mean, just trust me, there they will be. There will be people, that, that, and it's sad. It is so simple to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but yet the, the Satan's got into it, and he's deceived people in this area and that area, their areas of their life, and they've been deceived. Uh, they, there's false spirits out there. I mean, I, I believe in it 100%. There's false spirits that, that, that people get led away on. I, I just believe that. And, and, but there's only one way. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except by me. There's no other way. No other name under heaven where we must be saved other than through Christ. And that's it. But anybody, he'll, he'll divide them on this day. Next verse. Now, Jesus talking here, he begins to tell them. And I'm, and I'm sure if you're a Bible reader, you're familiar with this text. I'm, I'm sure you are. And he starts saying... He starts telling them why they have eternal life, why, why he put them on the right side. Now, I, I realize don't, don't take nothing out of context. It's impossible for you to be good and be, and be saved in, in you know, aspect of the world. You've got to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, period. Without shedding the blood, there's no remission of sin. Don't, 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 don't get mistaken what he's trying to say here. But he is trying to say in this text, if you have had that born-again experience, like I told you, we got a talent, and you want to do something for somebody. And I hope by the time this service is over, but you, you'll understand where I'm coming from with that. So it ain't just the fact is you can do these things when I'm saved, because that's what the world's doing. Because they're doing this thing, they think they're good, moral people, and they go in heaven. But that, that's not what this text says. But because they've been saved, because their name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, he says this, For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. In other words, he looked out, and, and, and he's talking about, and I'm not telling you shouldn't help lost people, so don't, 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 don't make more out of this than what I'm trying to say, but I am telling you, I am telling you in, in context of what it's telling me, if somebody in this church had a need and they was hungry, you ought to feed them. I am telling you that. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. And he said, I was thirsty. I mean, look at the different needs people have. I was thirsty. 
and you gave me drink. Listen, there's people that's legitimately have, have in this year, we're, we're, you're blessed to be able to, to fortune your own self, so to speak, with God's help. You're blessed. There's a lot of people can't do that. I mean, listen here, the Conway's full of homeless people. And I know what some people say, well, they want to be there. They want this. Listen, I, want, want to, I don't want to trade places to any one of them out there, and you don't either. If the truth, if you'd come out and tell the truth, regardless of what their situation is, regardless, would you trade places with them and spend and tonight? Listen, I've never slept on the streets of Conway like that. I spent three months out, three or four months outside in the desert sleeping outside in, in the wintertime, and it ain't fun. We ought to help those when we have the opportunity. I know sometimes we say, well, you know, I don't know what this is going to do with the money, that will do with the money. But in the context, he's talking about the brethren. He said brethren in the context. Well, I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. Now, now he gets to a stranger and you took me in. Next verse. We don't hurry. I won't get through it. Naked and you clothed me. I mean, all the bare necessities in life that people need. He said, hey, I, I was this, you give it to me and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came on me. I mean, he's covering all, all, all aspects of life, things that we ought to be doing if we're truly being saved. But next verse. Then shall the righteous answer say, Lord, when saw we thee hungry? In other words, they're saying, well, Jesus, we didn't see you thirsty. We didn't see you hungry. We didn't see you naked. We didn't see you in prison. The, the, the righteous said, Lord, we, we just didn't see you. Then shall the righteous answer say, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee or thirsty? And gave, Lord, we don't, we don't remember doing these things for you as the individual. Verse 38. When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? When, when, let me see, keep going. Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Next verse. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you done it, done it unto one of these, at least my brethren, you've done it unto me. The least of these, my brother, that, that one that's, that's, that's poor, the one that can't help from themselves, the one that's in need, that's not where you're at. He said, because you did it to them, you did it to me. It's important, it's important church, to help people. people people's in, people, I mean, I, I know everything may be good in, in most of our lives and for the most part, but there's people that's got legitimate needs and that's trouble this morning. There's people who woke up with a problem today they didn't have yesterday or, or struggles and and, or, or, you know, if people woke up, they don't know what they're going to do about eating. I mean, just telling you, it's, it's there, church. It's, it's there. And I realize we don't know the situation. We understand that. But I do believe God places people in our lives. What do we do with those when he puts people in our lives? What do we do with it? What do we do? I mean, if, if God places somebody in your path this week, are you just going to uh, drive right by? We're going to get to that in just a minute. Or, or are we going to do what we can to help out in whatever need they're in? Verse 41. Then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The only thing, he, the only thing they did, they, they may have been good moral people, and I don't want to read all the text because there's a couple other places I want to get to. It's the same thing I just read, except in reverse. Because you didn't do it. I, before I was hungry, and you gave me no meat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. Go, go down to the last verse of that chapter. Right? He goes through the same spill because he didn't do it. And these shall go into everlasting punishment. I'm just telling you what it says, everlasting punishment. Because they didn't do it. It's one thing to proclaim you're something, but you've but you got you to live it out. You've you got to walk in it. You've got to do it. I mean, some people old saying this, that you're the only Bible some people are ever going to read. They see what you're doing. Or they see what you're not doing. And helping people is part of it. I'm telling you, and I say this often, there's some of you in here, I mean, they, they, you're, you're great at it. You, you, can, you can teach people how to be like y'all are, some of you. I mean, I, I've seen it in my own eyes. And, and it should be something in us, a desire in us. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. And this is simple, the most simplest story in the Bible. It's not a parable. I've heard people call it a parable. It's not a parable. It's a true story that, that, that took place in my thinking. Let's see which verse it is. Maybe like 34 or something like that. Let me, let me go see which verse it is. I'm really not sure. I don't remember. I might not even wrote it down. Let me turn over there. 
19. Well, let's start in verse 10, 25. Let's start in 25. Very familiar story. Everybody, if you again, if you read your Bible very much, you, you know this story. And I'll just hit some highlights because there's one more place I want to finish up at in 1 John. So go back to 25. And behold, a certain lawyer tempted him. Now listen here, this particular, this particular guy would have been somebody that knew the Bible. In other words, it was somebody that went, just like you, the lawyer, you hire a lawyer today that knows uh, law. This lawyer with a new Bible, just like those lawyers downtown, know how to, to help you in your problem, whatever it is you're facing. It's same, same word, same thing. He, he would be like a lawyer of the work. You should know the Bible inside, and that should, should. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he didn't have good intentions with this question, I don't think. Now, you read behind some people say, well, he, you know, he, he didn't mean nothing by it. But, I mean, I think I, it says tempted him. I mean, I take it literally just what it says. In other words, he was trying to see how he could trip him up, how he could catch him, how he could outsmart Jesus, him being a lawyer. Maybe he could uh, tell Jesus something Jesus didn't know or something along those lines. Next verse. He said to him, what is written in the law? How read it? In other words, Jesus said, well, you know the law. You, 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 you deal with the law every day. What, what's in there? What's, what's written in the law? How do you read it? How do you interpret it, more or less? Next verse. And he answered, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. People always look for an excuse not to do something for God. And I, I, I just ain't pointing fingers at you because I've been, I, I've been right there. I, God but, or, or God who, I, I've, I've done it. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've done that. He's, but it's all you answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength, and your neighbor as thyself. Verse 28. And he said to them, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Next verse. But this is where we are all at. But he willing to justify himself. In other words, they, well, now there's people he didn't want to help. And then it's your, I, you know, I, I, we're all human. There's probably people that wouldn't be your favorite people to help. I understand that. But I don't mean you shouldn't help them when, when, when they have need. He said, but he's willing to justify himself, said in Jesus. And who is my neighbor? See, the man that lives right now, we, in our society, the man that lives next door to us there is, is a neighbor. Or, or maybe even a few houses down, whatever. We might even say my neighborhood. But he was trying to help this, just, Brother Bob, just the people he knew. Just, just the people he knew something about. That, that's what the, the man was getting at. That, it, have I got to help just anybody? Just define to me, just, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus gave him an answer. He sure didn't want to hear. Because he did not pick out the greatest person in society and said, well, and say, well, you know, help him. He didn't, he didn't do that, but he willing to justify himself, said, who is my neighbor? Next verse. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I mean, Jesus, didn't, I mean, talking about a neighbor, this would have been the furthest thing from this lawyer's mind. I mean, the furthest thing. Uh, he he'd probably never dreamed Jesus was going to say, because they were, they were totally enemies with the people that Jesus was getting ready to tell him about. But he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I don't know where it depends on where he at. It depends on where he at in the city, traveling time, 15, 20 miles. I mean, it just depends on where he at. But it's a pretty long journey. Um, I think from Jerusalem, when it goes downhill to Jericho, I think it's like a half a mile to sin. The sin like a half a mile in that distance. It's, it's a big, I can't remember the exact number, it's a lot. I mean, you got to realize... You're getting in the area not far from the Dead Sea, and that's the lowest, you know, 1,500 feet below sea level, 1,400 feet below sea level, like the lowest point on earth. So, so you go, you're going downhill. People didn't travel this by themselves very often because it was a dangerous road. It was, it was a dangerous road to travel. 
um, especially by yourself. Most times they would travel in caravans or, or big groups of people. You know, but you got off by yourself like that. It, it, it was just dangerous. There were thieves and there was robbers on the road. So a certain man went down, and this there is not a parable, like I said, because it, it's a true story. Something it, this there, it could have even been something that had happened recent in, in their times, or could have. But it was a story that they it, it, don't, don't get them mixed up. They weren't a parable. It was a story something that Jesus was telling. It could even been a, it's a possibility. It could even been a current event or something that taken, but it's possible. But a man fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, and leaving him half. Dead. I mean, this this man's in bad shape. He's laid over on by the road. I mean, he's he's he, and he's got nobody to help. He's by himself. He's alone. He's a long ways from home. There's a long distance between those two two points. I mean, he's he's half dead and he's 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 alone. He, he's he he don't have anybody. He he didn't have cell phones and internets and uh, things you and I have today to, to call nine one one or any other number. Just didn't have it. Before those times. And here he's half dead and he's nowhere. No help, no hope in the world, technically. Verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. You got to realize there was, they was thousands of priests. You do realize now, there's only one high priest a year. understand that. But there was literally thousands of priests. I mean, that was a whole tribe of people. I've read, I've read where as many as 12,000 priests could have, could have traveled this road in a day's time. As many as 12,000. I ain't say they did that every day, but as many as 12,000 could have passed that way. Now, under the law and stuff they were doing, if they'd come up on a man that was bleeding and bloody, they wouldn't have been able to touch them because they, they, they could have said, well, it make me unclean, and they'd have to go back and do this, perform this ceremony, perform that ceremony, whatever reason. We can all make an excuse why we can't help somebody. And by chance, there came a certain priest by the way, and when he saw him pass by on the other side, I mean, he didn't even get close to him. Didn't even get close to him. And you can think of every excuse you want to, because when we get there, we, we, there's, there's times that we think all kinds of excuses why we can't help that person. I mean, you, you realize, you realize this, this wouldn't really be no different than you passing a bad car accident out on 501. And they in the northbound lane, you in the southbound lane, you just look at it and say, well, I hate that. they in trouble and just keep right on driving. You say, I'm a, that's, what, that's what's happening. The same thing. It's the same. We might justify it differently, but it's the same principle. I mean, pass by on the other side of the road. It would have been a priest's job to help people get over that type of stuff, to have, to have some type of mercy and compassion on them. And, and you know, they'd have been, anyway, it would have, it would, it would have been their, their job description, more or less, if that had been a Jewish man. And, I, and, I, and, and unless there, I, it don't say, but I, I'm assuming it was his brother. But he passed by on the other side of it, verse 22. I can't hardly see them numbers sometimes. Whatever it is, and that can. 32, I'm sorry, I can't already see them numbers. And likewise, a Levite. Now, this is the same tribe now. They were Levites, the priests were Levites. But this year, and you had to have a lot of priests. I mean, they weren't, every one of them per se a priest, but you had to have a lot of priests. And I, and the reason I tell you that is because this believed the year that Jesus uh, the year that Jesus was crucified there, there was as many as uh, 250,000 lambs slaughtered that, that year. So one priest got to done that, or ten priests got to done that. It took hundreds of thousands, it took probably thousands of priests to be able to handle that. But still, there was a job that the Levites could do as well. Now, to put it in perspective where you'll understand it better in today's society, you can relate the priest to the preacher. But when you lead a preacher and everybody else in here, these deacons and Sunday school teachers, and you can consider you a Levite in the context. Put it in context where you'll understand what's happening. That, that, that's what it's telling you. Now, now, the preacher was the first one, but you could say that. But then the rest, you know, the ones that work in church work. If you've got a job in the church whatsoever at all, we could call you a Levite. So likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him 
Now, I don't know that the oven stopped, but it looks like this one might have stopped and, you know, it might have got his attention. But he still didn't go to him. I don't know. It, it got me there. He looked on him and it passed by on the other side. I, I don't know. One time you want to think maybe, maybe he's starting to come a little bit closer, but still he passed on the other side, and that's all I can tell you. That's what it says. Again, somebody that should have had enough mercy because of what they dealt with on a daily basis, they ought to have some mercy and compassion and help, but they didn't. Again, just like you and I, make excuses of why we can't do it. You know, they'd be ceremonial, all unclean. Now, we'll tell you this, maybe one out of a thousand, but now all of them had to have been ceremonially clean that day. But anyway, there's all types of excuses that come up in our mind why we can't do this, why we can't do that. And they listened to the excuses, and they kept, I don't know, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, Samaritans were inbred of half, half, half mixed, mixed up people. They, they had some Jew in them, but they were, they were mixed up. And, and, and they were really an outcast in society, and, and they did not, the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. We see that in the story with Jesus and the Samaritan woman when he, at the well in John chapter 4. We see that. When the woman asked him, why are you asking me for water? He said, you don't, you know, y'all don't, we don't have any dealings with one another. That's in the Bible. It's in there, plain. So, so we know it's true. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. I mean, when he looked and he saw him, I mean, he, he comes he come straight to where he was. I mean, it don't say he was a Levite. Don't say he had any dealings with the church whatsoever at all. Uh, any type of church or temple or synagogue. Or whatever. Yeah, maybe they did, but it don't say nothing about it. Don't mention it. But he had compassion on him. Now, I, I, I don't know this, and I can't prove this no more than you can disprove it. But him being a Samaritan, being the outcast, being the person... That, that's probably needed help many times and the Jews passed right by and there's a good possibility this Samaritan had been in a similar situation. That's my thinking. Because let me tell you something, when you go through some struggles and you go through some trials and you go through things in life, you look at life differently. Yeah. Trust me, when I, I, look, my, I, I look at things a lot differently than I did once upon a time. A lot, a lot differently. So I, I, and, and this year, I, I try to, in nowadays, to put myself in somebody else's shoes. What if that was me? What would I need? What would I want? What, what would I do? But the Samaritan, as he journey came to where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion on him. I mean, I, I can't believe it. I mean, no, no doubt he ran up there and fell on his knee. You don't say that. I understand. But, you, mean, you, you know, you got to do something to get down there close to him to pick him up. I mean, we went from somebody that just passed by on the other side of the road to somebody just run right up and, and just had compassion on him. Listen, it all, it, it, this story, is, this is complete strangers. I understand strangers might not do us like that, but I'm going to tell you about when we, all, when we see people that we know, brothers and sisters, people that we know, that, we're, we, that, we, that we know well, we're friends with, and they go through problems, they struggle with the problem, we ought to be right there to help them. Yeah. We ought to be brokenhearted like they are. I mean, I told you that last week. I read it in the text last week. Weep when they weep, rejoice when they rejoice. You remember we just done that last week. Verse 34. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. I realize this was physical wounds, and undoubtedly the man was bleeding. I mean, from what I'm gathering from the text, the man was bleeding, from what I see, from what I read out of that. But it says he poured in oil and wine. Both of those in the Bible are symbolism of the Spirit. Both are. Now, there's a lot of people that's broken today that, that's wounded. They ain't, might not need that physically needs like this man needs, but spiritually they need a double portion of what you have to be able to help them get out of what they're in. Don't, and this, I, I realize people make mistakes. People mess up. Pe people get themselves, uh, if they're anything like I was, I, I was beat up enough my own self without somebody else having to do it because I knew I was wrong but I didn't know how to get out of where I was at and get where I needed to be. I just didn't. And there's other people sitting out there, trust me, there's other people out there, they, they end up and they've got themselves in a situation and, and the only thing they need out of you is, is support and, and, and support. 
and to tell them that if they'll, if they'll repent from whatever is going on in their life, that God loves them still and, and, and have compassion on them. I told you last week, that's all I cared about was just somebody, and was just somebody to come up and have compassion. And nobody did but outside of family, but that's what, I, that's what I needed. If a man or a woman has gotten themselves in a situation that, that's caused them harm to them and their family, trust me when I tell you, they're beat up enough between the shame and, the, and the, they're, they're beat up enough. They need love from you. Right. They, they need comfort. They need compassion. They need somebody to go to them, put their arms around them and tell them that you love them, that, to trust God and repent. Get out of where you're at. God's going to love you and he's going to see you through this. I believe that. Amen. That says, and he went to him and he bound up his wounds and poured down oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end and took care of him. I mean, he just didn't bind up his wounds and, and fix him and send him on his way. I mean, he, he took him to a motel. I mean, that's what it means in so many words. It would be no different than you taking somebody to a motel. You staying overnight with them. And took care of them. You know what? In this text right here, I end, a church ought to be in. Church ought to be a place where when people are hurt, they can come back to and get the help and, and the compassion and, and the things that they need. Church ought to be that. It ought to be a hospital for those that's, those that are broken. This year, we've all sometimes point in our life been through things that's broken us in different different ways of our life. And and, and, and church is at one place. This year, we ought to be able to come to church. You ought to be able to get your mind off what this year. There's nothing but troubles outside the door of these church. Amen. This year, tomorrow will be Monday. And Norman, tell me when I trust me, I tell you, it'll be Monday all day for some of you that works outside. You, it'll be Monday all day. It'll be something. But today, I mean, here it, is, it feels good to be in God's house, and I ain't thinking about those things going on out there tomorrow. It's a place I could come and find peace and comfort and help from the Lord because He knows what I'm going to face next week, and He can give me what I need today to help me through next week. Church ought to be that place for church to people to get help. Don't need to be beat down and beat up. Need to, need to be lifted up and, and, and tell them that yeah. you know, repent from your sins, sure, by all means. But God loves you, and He went to the cross of Calvary and He died because He knew He was going to have problems and struggles and trials. And, and, and forgive us and forgive your sins and set you back where you need to be. This man was alone on this road. I told you a week or two ago, the devil does everything he can to drive you away from the crowd to get you off alone. And when he gets you off alone, that's when he moves in and he, he destroys people. If he can just separate you and get you away from a, from a crowd and just single you out, no different than a wild animal singles out the one that's, that's, that's off by themselves. If the devil can just get you alone. And that's why, and that just, this, this story here just further proves that point. The man was alone. Verse 35. And on the morrow when the, he departed, he took out two pence and gave them the host, to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, this there is court on who you read behind. And I, don't, and I really didn't read behind nobody this time, but in the past I have. That could have been as much as a couple of weeks worth of stuff to take care of this man. Could have been. Could have. Anyway, he said, take care of him. If I ain't back, when I come back, I'll pay the rest of it. But verse, next verse. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor to him that fell? Among the thieves. Now, see, he's answered this question who neighbor was. Who's your, who's your neighbor? Yeah. They were totally strangers now, totally outcast. He's now who you think was neighbor. Next verse. And he said, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Sister, you got to have mercy on people. And I'm going to further prove that we're finishing up. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Uh, I don't remember now if it's 12 or 13. Verse John chapter 3. I want to read 17, but I'm going to read a few verses before we get there. Let's go to verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. 
He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. John speaking now. Same John that wrote St. John's in the book of Revelation is wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Next verse. Hereby perceive we the love of God. You want to know what the love of God is? He's fixing to tell us. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. We ought to lay down our lives for the brother. Now, now listen, this next verse is where I want to get to, and I'm going to close with this. Verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? I said in the beginning, you, weren't, you don't work to get saved and understand all that, but once you're saved, there's something all of us can do. And helping people is something everybody in here can do. No, you might not be able to preach. No, you might not be able to teach. You might not be able to sing. You might not be able to play an instrument. But everybody in this building is capable of doing what I told you about this morning to help somebody when you see a need. And here the Bible's plain, claiming. How does God dwell? You got the means to help. You have the opportunity, and you got the means. You got the money, and you got the opportunity. And you shut up your bowels of compassion and just leave it to somebody else to do. Just let somebody else do it. You, well, somebody else will come along. Somebody else will do this. Somebody else will do that. But he says, how dwells the love of God in him? How does God dwell, love dwell in you? And you see needs that people have, and you, and, you can, and you can meet the need. You don't do it. How? I don't, you know, I don't, y'all know I'm not, per se, hard on it. The Bible plainly says, let every man be a liar, but God be the truth. Amen. And that ain't taking it out of context either. I mean, it, it, it just, what you going to do with it, Tony? You, you, you got to go by what God's Word says. And I don't point fingers at people. I got my own faults and my failures, but I'm just telling you, we need to start helping people. People are in trouble. Preacher Tony Bryson's coming in back there. <laughs> I didn't realize he was in here. How you doing? Good to see you. I didn't realize he came in back there a few minutes ago. I seen somebody, but it was him. Um, but we got we got to learn to help people. Amen. I mean, that's a, uh, by this y'all may know you or my disciples. You have love one to another. We, we got to learn to love people. I mean, we got to learn. I told you over and over and over. Half of the commandments have to do with our relationship to God. The other half to have to do with our relationship to man. Your your relationship with man around you is important to God. It's important. The way we treat one another, the way we, what we do or don't do for one another, it, it's it's just important. And everybody needs somebody. Everybody. And I encourage you to, do, to take that room around you. I mean, that, you know, just check up on some of your people that you're closest to. And if you see, see needs in their life, I mean, try to do something to help them. So, listen, sometimes it ain't the money. Trust me. I mean, like, sometimes it's just if you would just talk to somebody. That's right. I mean, listen, that, that, would, that, that, you, that, may, that would mean more than you could ever imagine in a lot of people's lives. If you would just give them enough of your time to sit down and listen and hear them out, hear their side of the story, whatever's going on. I'm just telling you. But we care about people, have compassion on people. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, anybody got a question or a comment? Anything you want to say or add? Go ahead, Brother. Right. Right.
Anybody else? Right, I understand. I mean, there are people out there, sure, I'm telling you, we, we're blessed. Amen. I mean, I, you know, I got a closet full of shoes. I mean, I'm just, just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I understand. They are.
Right. Right. I can help him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Sure. 